On September 29, 1978, Mary along with two other hitchhikers sat on the side of the road, anxiously waiting for a ride. They had already declined two others that day, saying that the drivers were just way too creepy, and it seemed as though nobody else was going to stop for them. That was until 50-year-old Lawrence Singleton pulled up in his blue van and started to converse with the three nomads. When they asked him for a ride, he agreed, but he stated that there was only enough space for one person, and of course, it could only be Mary. Exhausted and just wanted to get to her grandfather's house as soon as possible, she agreed. However, as she settled onto the front seat, she hesitated. There was clearly enough space for both of her friends to join. Sensing something was very off with the entire situation, her companions begged for her not to go. Now slightly alarmed, Mary took another look at her driver, but he seemed harmless and honestly just a reminder of a quote grandpa type figure. Disarmed by his docile demeanor, she shook off her suspicions and settled in for what would unknowingly be an unprecedented 48 hours of torture and survival. Hello guys, my name is Nate, and today I'm going to be talking about the story of Mary Vincent, who at the age of 15 managed to survive having both of her arms cut off before being thrown over a 30 foot cliff and stuffed into a drainage pipe. Yeah, she's the definition of a badass. Mary Vincent was the middle child of seven, born into a military family in Las Vegas, Nevada. She was a very talented dancer, quickly rising to the position of captain for her prestigious dance troupe. By all accounts, Mary had both the talent and ambition to be on an international stage performing for millions. However, around this time, Mary's home life was incredibly volatile. Her parents were going through a very messy divorce, and the animosity and stress between the two started to affect the entire household. There were frequent blowouts, and the father's anger was oftentimes directed towards Mary. So, as most teens in this situation, she started to rebel. Running away from home was not abnormal for her. At one point, she'd even left with her boyfriend and lived out of his car for a summer in Sausalito, California. He was eventually arrested for sexually assaulting a teenage girl, forcing Mary to move back home. Wanting to escape her hostile environment, Mary again ran away, this time sleeping in cars and abandoned buildings, before ultimately deciding to stay at her grandfather's house in Los Angeles, California. As stated before, Mary was a frequent traveler and felt as though she had developed some type of sixth sense for detecting the weird ones. Unfortunately, Mary's sixth sense seemed to not pick up on the demon that was Lawrence Singleton. The initial hours of the drive showed a great deal of fortitude on Mary's part. Singleton made multiple sexual mm -hmm. advances toward 15-year-old Mary, with her, of course, declining every single one. Her repeated refusals fell on deaf ears because eventually, Singleton tried to pull Mary closer to him, forcing her towards the passenger side door in an attempt to avoid his crusty, dusty fingers. The reality of her predicament slowly began to weigh on her. Here she was, trapped in a car, alone, with the embodiment of a walking colonoscopy bag that did not take no for an answer. Eventually, after promising he would keep his hands to himself, she grew more comfortable and slowly drifted off to sleep. Mary awoke to the ambient sounds of the desert night. The hairs on the back of her neck stood up, sensing a shift in the car's atmosphere. She glanced at a passing highway marker and realized that they were headed back towards Las Vegas. You know that voice in the back of your head that tells you when something very bad is about to happen? Well, Mary's had finally woken up and was politely saying, uh, you know, we should definitely be a little worried right now. She began to fumble around her seat looking for something, just anything, that she could use as a weapon. She felt the end of a sharp stick, quickly grabbing it and turning it to her would-be kidnapper, demanding that he turn around. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm just an honest man that made a mistake, he said as he politely smiled and turned the car around. Soon after, Singleton pulled off into a car stop saying that he had to go pee. The voice in Mary's head was now screaming. Something was very, very wrong and she needed to get away now, and this? This was her chance. She was young and he was old. She could easily get away if she needed to, right? She took a quick look at her shoes and realized that they were untied. Preparing for the worst, Mary stepped out of the car, bent down, and began to tie them. A blinding pain shot from the back of her head, instantly knocking her to the pavement. Unbeknownst to her, Singleton stood behind her, wielding the sledgehammer that had delivered her into unconsciousness. Mary's eyes shot open. She now found herself naked and bound by rope in the back of Singleton's van, with him creepily standing over her, smiling, and seemingly waiting for her to wake up. Singleton then proceeded to brutally assault her over and over and over again. Mary could do nothing but hope and pray for a brief reprieve from the torture, which only ever came when Singleton slept or changed locations. The attacks lasted throughout the entire night and only stopped as the sun breached the horizon. As the assaults came to an end, Mary again pleaded with Singleton to let her go. Ignoring her, he grabbed her arm and violently dragged her out of the van before tossing her to the ground. You want to be free? I'll set you free, he spat as he pulled out a hatchet. Mary now sat there in shock as blood began to flow from what remained of her left arm. 
Adrenaline coursed through her veins, pushing her to fight back. She was not about to die without a fight. As Singleton swung down on her right arm, Mary kicked, screamed, twisted, and turned, doing anything to stop this monster from accomplishing his sick goals. Unfortunately, she could only delay the inevitable. Through blurred vision, Mary could make out Singleton vigorously throwing his arm back and forth, trying to get something off. Her right arm still clung to his bicep, refusing to give up the fight. Mary's body now lay on the pavement, motionless, with a pool of blood quickly forming around her. Thinking her dead, Singleton looked around for a place to dispose of her body before settling his eyes on a nearby ravine. He picked her up and made his way over before throwing her over the edge. He then climbed down and attempted to stuff her body into a cement sewer pipe. Looking at her one more time as he climbed out, he chuckled and said, Okay, now you're free. I needed to survive. I couldn't let him do this to someone else. This was the only thought that was running through Mary's mind as she lay there naked and covered in a grotesque mixture of blood and dirt. She was fading in and out of consciousness due to all the blood loss, but she was determined to survive. Through sheer willpower, she managed to stick what remained of her arms into the ground, mixing the dirt and her blood to create mud packs and slowing the bleeding. Over the course of a day, Mary managed to crawl through mud and sewage before climbing over the 30-foot cliff again with no arms. She's the actual definition of not today, Satan. I just love it. Eventually, she pulled herself over the edge and wandered around for hours until she stumbled upon a freeway. She was able to follow it for three miles before spotting two men driving straight towards her. She tried to yell and wave at them, but when they saw her, they just noped out of there. Which, listen, hear me out. Like, if I saw a girl covered in blood with no arms running towards my car, my fight or flight, it's flying, I'm sorry, but I'm gone. Fortunately, Lux seemed to suddenly want to favor me. A couple in town on their honeymoon had taken a wrong turn and stumbled upon her. They immediately pulled over and wrapped a blanket around her before driving to a local airport to call an ambulance. Remember, this was the 70s, so cell phones were pretty much non-existent. She was quickly taken by helicopter to a local hospital for treatment, where she immediately described Singleton to a sketch artist. Her description was so good, in fact, that the sketch came out looking smack like this dude. It soon began to circulate in the media, and Singleton's neighbor, who was also his friend, called in to report him. W human right here. In 1979, Singleton went to court, where Mary testified against him. She pointed at him with her prosthetic arm and said, that's him, referring to him only as my attacker, something of which she continues to this very day. When she finished her testimony, she was forced to walk past Singleton, allowing this mongrel to whisper to her saying, if it's the last thing I do, I will finish the job. According to Singleton, he was drunk that night and described Mary as a $10 whore. He claimed that the other two hitchhikers were in the car, along with another dude named Larry. He stated that if there was any evidence found, it was the other Larry, not him. In the end, Lawrence Singleton was sentenced to the maximum of 14 years for attempted murder. Mary's experience after returning home was very difficult. She was now smack dab in the public eye over something she was still healing from. She enrolled at a local school for the handicapped, and unfortunately, all of her former friends had abandoned her. The relationship between her and her parents had worsened as they both felt guilt and anger about the entire situation, with her saying that they were more interested in what they felt about what happened to me rather than what I felt. Her dad even started collecting guns and became very vocal about his plots to kill Singleton. Her parents' relationship, of course, was not helped by this experience, resulting in the exact environment Mary had so desperately tried to get away from. It was as if nothing had changed. So she left again. This time she found a small town in Washington where she was able to get married and have children. Being a mother was something she had always dreamt of literally since she was four years old, so this was pretty much heaven for her. Her life was finally starting to look brighter. That was until 1989 when Singleton was released from prison on good behavior after only serving eight of his 14 year sentence. America justice system right here, love it. Singleton's release was met with extreme backlash as nobody wanted him in their town. His own daughter didn't even want him released, saying that he routinely attacked both her and her mother. Apparently, her mom was genuinely surprised that she was born without any health complications just because of how much he abused her during the pregnancy. Soon after being released, Singleton sued Mary because apparently she had threatened him with a pointy stick. Y'all remember that stick she picked up when he tried to kidnap her? Yeah, that one. This is what made him violent. This is what made him torture her for an entire night before cutting off both of her arms in an attempt to remove identification. She was the problem. Freaking Larry. Of course, the case was dismissed. Singleton's promise to finish the job still resonated within Mary and became even scarier when he stated that he was visiting the state that she was currently living in. With the looming threat of another attack in the ever-watching eye of the media, her life started to fall apart. 
her marriage ended and soon after, the only income she was receiving came from her disability checks. On top of that, Singleton was broke, so he never paid any of the reparations that the court had ordered, totaling $2.5 million. At one point, Mary's home was actually foreclosed on, forcing her and her two boys to sleep in an abandoned Arco station in the middle of winter with no heat. But she was determined to keep fighting, even more so now that she had two kids that depended on her. Mary's fears were confirmed where in 1990, a year after his release, Lawrence Singleton attacked again, this time killing single mother of three, Roxanne Hayes. As soon as Mary saw that Singleton had struck again, she knew that she wanted to do everything in her power to put this man away for the rest of his life. For 10 minutes, Singleton sat in a courtroom despondent as Mary gave an emotional retelling of the horror he had put her through. Using her testimony, the prosecution was able to ask for the death penalty, but unfortunately, before that could be followed through with, he died from cancer, avoiding proper sentencing yet again. The outrage that followed Singleton's initial release and subsequent second murder resulted in the passing of the Singleton Bill, which allowed judges to sentence between 25 years to life in prison if the victim was tortured. Such a bill would have put Singleton in prison for the rest of his life, possibly saving both Mary's psyche and Roxanne's life. In the end, Mary was finally able to find solace in the fact that this monster was now gone, forever. Although Mary's dance career was now over due to the injuries from her incident, Mary found a new passion and career in painting and giving motivational speeches to others. Alrighty guys, that was the insane survival story of Mary Vincent. I told you guys that she was the definition of a badass. If you'd like to see more content like this, hit that like button because it, you know, it lets me know that I'm doing something right. And also your boy would be over the moon if you'd hit that subscribe button or even check out these other two videos. Okay, that's it. Bye.